Okay, so you recall last time we introduced a sequence alignment method that we referred to as global alignment. And the idea there was that we would align the entire length of both sequences to each other such that if any portion of one sequence were left out of the alignment, it would be charged a gap penalty. Okay? Another way of saying that is that the alignment path must extend all the way from the origin corner that represents the beginning of both of our sequences all the way to the opposite corner representing the end of both sequences. Okay? And since we require the path to extend all the way from one corner to the opposite corner, that means every single letter in both sequences is going to be included in the score that's summed over that path. Okay? There are applications where that assumption is actually a poor fit to what we're looking for in our sequence alignment problem. A classic example of this would be when we have um, a specific domain that we're searching for in multi-domain proteins. Okay? So you're probably aware that uh, in eukaryotic genomes, protein sequences are oftentimes quite complex and contain each, uh, each individual protein sequence would contain multiple domains that are assembled in uh, complicated domain architectures. So it's very common for uh, proteins to match not over the entire length of the sequence, in other words, every single domain matches and the order matches. But instead, we might have just one individual domain might match between two protein sequences and the rest of the sequence would not match. Or even if they share multiple domains, the order of the domains might not be the same. <coughs> and therefore, when we try to do sequence alignment, it's basically going to have to choose which domains to align because the alignment's not consistent. In other words, if the order changes, it, it will only be able to align one of the domains and not the other because they're out of order with respect to each other. Okay? So uh, bioinformaticists have developed a variation on sequence alignment that's referred to as local sequence alignment, and it's designed specifically for this kind of problem where we're actually not trying to detect um, homology over the entire length of both sequences, but instead over just a sub-segment of those sequences. Okay? So this actually is very, very simple to understand at the mechanical level. That is to say, it's going to be a slight change to our scoring for alignment. So the, you'll recall from last time we basically had three moves. Our diagonal move representing match or so-called mismatch, in other words substitution. And then we had our two so-called gap moves, the horizontal move and the vertical move representing indels. All we're going to do is add one additional move, which basically um, we could call um, just start. And the idea is that um, we can, at any given position within the matrix, actually begin a new sub-alignment. In other words, we are not required to start at the origin corner of, of the matrix. The path can begin anywhere within the matrix. So in adding this new move, <clears throat> the only thing that we have to um, add to our, our picture of alignment is basically how are we going to score the start move. We know how to score those three moves. That's our match score or our mismatch score and then our gap penalty. So the answer for the start move is 
it always, as you might imagine, means a score of zero. Okay? So whenever we, we choose a start move, that means we're setting the score to zero. This has an immediate implication for filling in our dynamic programming matrix. Because a score of zero is always better than any score that is negative, right? So what that means is, as we're filling in our matrix, regions that don't show substantial homology or similarity, they're going to be getting negative scores coming from mismatch. They're going to be getting negative scores coming from indels. And consequently, there's going to be negative scores being offered up by these moves. So over and over again, what the alignment is going to end up choosing is start at zero as the preferred move. It may not lead anywhere because, again, one will simply start having more um, mismatch and, and gap penalties piled on top of it. But it basically means you will never choose uh, a, typically a negative score. Start The start move will always be preferred. Okay. So um, when we apply this, it has um, the following basic uh, shape. Let's say on our x-axis we have a sequence that goes something like T, G, A, C, and then maybe um, along our vertical we'll have G, G, A. So again, we subdivide our matrix individual letters you'll recall for the global alignment we had an initial column and row that represented basically skipping individual letters before we began our alignment so again in line with this start at zero uh, move option. Basically, instead of filling in gap penalties here, we're just going to fill in zeros. Okay? <coughs> so for local alignment, the initial row and column is just zero. Zero, 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 zero. Okay, so what that reflects is we're not charging any gap penalty for skipping letters of our initial sequence. Okay. So now we apply our uh, usual uh, procedure, except we now incorporate this start at zero move. Okay. So, uh, for example, here, if we had, uh, again, let's use the numbers that we had before. I think we said match was plus 5, we said mismatch was, uh, we said minus 2, and gap, let's say minus 3, something like that. So aligning a G versus a T, that's uh, a mismatch, so basically um, we're going to uh, say start at zero, okay? Because our gaps and our diagonals are all negative scores, so zero is better than a negative score. So here we have a G versus a G, so that would be a match diagonal, a score of positive five. The other possible moves are worse than positive five. A versus uh, a G would give a minus 2, whereas if we take the gap going horizontally from the positive 5, 
that'll be 5 minus 3, that'll be a positive 2. So we choose that. C versus the G, that would give us a negative score that way and um, a negative 1 that way. Therefore, start at 0 is our preferred move. So we put the 0. Proceeding on to the T versus the G, we have um, basically a mismatch again. We're going to get uh, negative values if we take the, the gaps. So start at 0 is preferred. Now we can uh, do G versus G, and that would give a positive 5 going back to a start at 0, so a total score of positive 5 for the diagonal, versus if we take the gap, um, we're going to be taking a minus 3 plus 5, that would give us positive 2, so positive 5 is greater than positive 2, so we take the diagonal, give us a score of 5, okay? A versus G um, was going to be a minus 2 for the diagonal, that would be positive 3, versus the gap is a worse score, so we take the diagonal and we have a score of 3. C versus G um, is going to be a mismatch. It would take us to zero versus start at zero. So it's basically a tie. So um, for simplicity, I'm just going to take the zero there. Okay. Continuing to fill out our matrix here, T versus A, that would be a diagonal of minus two. The others are gaps. So start at zero is the best score there. G versus A would, again, be a mismatch. We have a gap going to the positive 5. So 5 plus minus 3 is the best score, positive 2. A versus A, that's a diagonal match of positive 5, starting from a score of positive 5. So that gives us a positive 10. And then our final... Uh, score here, C versus A, that would be a, uh, mis a, a mismatch of minus 2 plus 3 would give us positive 1, but if we take the horizontal here, we can get a gap on top of a positive 10 to give us a 7. We've now finished filling in our matrix. The last step that's required is backtracking. Backtracking is a little bit more complicated in the local alignment variant than in global because, again, the whole idea of local alignment is an alignment path can begin or end anywhere in the matrix. Okay? So that means instead of being restricted to beginning and ending at these two opposite corners, we can begin and end anywhere in here. So, what do you think would be the rule for choosing where we take as our endpoint of the optimal local alignment path? Yeah, basically we scan the entire matrix to find the highest value. So in that case, that's our positive 10 right there. So that's the endpoint of our optimal local alignment path. And again, we just follow the... Uh, saved best move in each cell until we hit a start move, okay? So in that case, that means diagonal, diagonal, start, okay? So the only thing that gets aligned then is basically that portion to that portion. So you can see what local alignment has done here is it's just pulled out a sub-segment of our vertical sequence to match against a subsegment of our horizontal sequence. This was a trivial case where we didn't have, you know, interesting substitutions or insertions and deletions within that segment, but that's certainly possible. Local alignment, as long as the, the addition of further matches after an indel will actually make the total score go up, local alignment will include it in the reported alignment. Okay. Any questions about um, how you actually do local alignment?